So last week in the comments, somebody made the suggestion that we do a video on camshaft wear patterns. And I said, you know, that's a great idea. That's fairly universal. And I started thinking about it, like, well, it's not as simple a topic to cover as just, well, here, this means this and this means this. There's actually a whole universe of things that this encompasses. So if you're into, like, heavy-duty gearhead nerd stuff, you hit the jackpot with this video. Camshaft wear patterns. All right, so naturally this only applies to flat tappet cams. Hydraulic and solid doesn't make any difference in this case. Doesn't apply to rollers. Rollers don't have taper, and so there's no wear pattern to be established between the cam and the lifter. Now some early, early engines and some even later engines, European motors, industrial motors, agricultural motors, don't have any taper built into the lobes, and they don't have any crown built into the lifters. And I'll talk about that in a second. What they do is they offset the lifter in relation to the lobe, and so that offset keeps the lifter spinning and eliminates wear or reduces wear. On all of the engines we deal with, the lifter is centered on the lobe. And so in order to keep the lifter rotating and thus eliminate wear, keep this thing from wearing, there's taper built into the lobe of the camshaft. You can't see it by eye, but you can measure it. So one part of the lobe is gonna be taller than the other part, so it's gonna be ground on a taper, okay? And the lifter, while it appears flat, isn't actually flat, there's a crown built into it, okay? The combination of the crown and the taper keep the, ro keep the lifter rotating as it goes through its motions. That's what keeps it from wearing. Now, when we talk about wear patterns, this is where things start to get a little funky, okay? And you have to understand where these wear patterns come from, why they're different, and why the lifter mates itself to the lobe. And you can't just take this lifter. After it's established a relationship with the lobe, you can't just take this lifter and put it on another one. Okay. Through the engine, there are different circumstances that exist, dynamic circumstances that exist as the engine is running. Example, variations in spring tension, variations in valve weight, for example, will have an effect on how much effort or how much force the lifter sees as it meets, as it meets the lobe. The most important factor is oil, oil distribution. So now you gotta remember that the cam and lifter interface is not lubricated directly. It's lubricated by splash. It's almost lubricated by luck. There are two sources for this oil. The first source, and probably the primary source, is what's allowed to leak out around the bottom of the lifter to the lobe. So there's the clearance between the lifter bore, my, my hand is the lifter bore, and the lifter, just loose enough so that oil can bleed past here and drip directly down onto the lobe of the cam. As an engine ages, that changes. It'll vary from, from lobe to lobe because you'll have varnish and gum buildup around the bottom of the, the bore, and so that'll restrict some oil that gets to the camshaft, which is really why an older engine, the older an engine is, the more critical that break-in period becomes. Because that oil distribution through the bottom of the bores is going to be different. It's going to be reduced from when the engine was new. Now here's the other one, right? Okay. The camshaft is also oiled by splash. It's oiled by windage. By the oil that's thrown off the connecting rods. You know the side clearance on the connecting rods? Well the oil is allowed to bleed past that side clearance, and as the engine is rotating, that oil is thrown up at the cam. That's what's lubricating this interface. Now, the thing you have to remember about this is that windage is not the same from, let's say, the front to the back of the engine. Different cylinders in different locations of the motor are gonna have different characteristics. Because as the engine is running, there's a whole like, atmospheric like, thing that's going on inside the engine. Uh, winds, windage, wind, um, different dynamics. Like for example, 
if you have a cylinder or, or connecting rod that's adjacent to a counterweight, a big counterweight, it's going to throw oil in a different way than a connecting rod that's not adjacent to a big counterweight or it's adjacent to a smaller counterweight. So as the bottom end is rotating, the oil coming off is going to be thrown in inconsistent ways. And it's going to change at RPM. You're going to have one situation, let's say at idle or very low speeds, another one at 3,000 RPM, another one at 6,000 RPM. So the amount of oil that this is getting, that this, this relationship is getting from the bottom end is going to change. And that's why a lobe that gets, let's say, splashed with a lot of oil is going to have a film, a thick film that it's going to, that the lifter is going to ride on. And the taper area here is going to see less of, a, of, of that film. And so you'll see a narrower area than you will on, let's say, an, a lobe that gets not nearly as much. And you'll see a slightly wider pattern here because that film of oil is thinner. All right. Now the taper. Okay. As I said, you can't see the taper, but it's there. And it's, it's there for two reasons. It's hot in here. It's about 100 degrees. So if I look like I'm hot and sweaty, right, and clumsy, I am hot and sweaty and clumsy. The taper is there for two reasons. The taper, its primary purpose is to keep the lifter rotating. But it has a secondary purpose, and that's to locate the camshaft. Now this is important. Some engines have what's called a thrust plate at the front of the cam. This is a small block Mopar, and a small block Mopar has a thrust plate. So this rides right over here. Okay. So now this is what's happening. And, and other engines don't. Big block Chrysler doesn't have it. Chevy Motors don't have it. You just run through the list. Some engines have thrust plates. Some engines don't have thrust plates. On an engine that does not have a thrust plate, the taper on the lobes is used to keep the camshaft biased to the back of the engine, okay? Here's the reason for this. This is the helical gear that drives the oil pump and the distributor. Again, it, this is a small block Chrysler, so this gear is at the back like it would be on a Chevy, but it could be a Ford with it in the front. It doesn't make any difference. It's slant six where it's in the middle. It could be anywhere, but the principle is the same. It's a helical cut gear. And as this is driving the oil pump and the distributor, as it's driving them, this helical cut is pulling the camshaft back to the back of the engine. Now, when you're at light cruise or deceleration, the cam, this helical cut, is now working to push the camshaft forward. Because if the oil pump isn't being driven, now it represents resistance. And when it represents that resistance, it's trying to push the helical cut forward. So, those engines are ground with the taper all to the one side, to the back. So that that taper is pushing the camshaft back. On a thrust plate engine like this one here, the taper doesn't have to be pushing the camshaft back. And in fact, that taper would represent a parasitic loss. So, if a thrust plate engine has the lobes ground correctly, all right, it's going to have the taper on one side or the other. Or, or I, should, I should say it'll alternate the taper from one to the other. So here's an example of this. Here's, the, remember now, the shiny part represents the taper, the high part, and the dark part represents just the, the bare, the base metal, right? So here you see the taper is to the back, the taper is to the back. Now look at these two lobes. The taper is to the front, the taper is to the front. So what's happening here is that the taper, these two lobes, are offsetting the force that these two lobes, they're canceling each other out. And this is done through the whole camshaft. And this is so that it minimizes the parasitic losses of the cam being pushed back all the time. The thrust plate is making sure that it won't ride forward on deceleration. 
Not all cam manufacturers will grind like this. This is the Lunati cam, and they grind the proper way for a thrust plate engine. But I have seen thrust plate camshafts where the taper is all in one shot, in, in one area. That's like a, it's like almost like a universal Chevy lobe that they put on all of these different cams, or a profile that they put grind into all these different cams. But this one here is ground correctly for a thrust plate engine. There is no back and forth. Now, of course, roller cams don't have any taper at all. None. Thrust plate roller cam engines use a button at the front that are right against the timing cover or the water pump housing. And so on a deceleration, the button keeps the camshaft from moving forward. Trivia, right? I told you, you do a simple thing. It's like, oh, camshaft wear patterns. That's such a simple video, right? No, there's a whole, like, like anything with engines, there's a whole universe of things, of factors that go into it. And this is why I always say, right? Find the engine that you love the most, the one that you love the most, and really focus on that one because then you're going to discover all of these little micro facts and, and, and things that apply strictly to that engine. It's how you get the biggest bang for your buck. You show, you show this camshaft to a guy, let's say, who does nothing but Chevy motors, and he'll look at the wear pattern on that cam and he'll be like, what happened there? Throw that thing away. It's junk, right? No, it's actually the way it's supposed to be. So how do you tell if the pattern is good? All right. So you can see on each of these lobes, you've, we've got a stripe, okay? And that stripe represents the high part of the lobe and where the lifter is being rotated. Now, if you look at the base circle of the cam, where the lifter is seeing its least amount of load, so the spring isn't really pushing down on it, nothing, there's no real action, you see that it's very faint, okay? Now, when you get to the ramp, and now the valve spring is starting to push down on this thing, you can see the pattern starting to spread out. It's starting to get wider, okay? And then when you get to here, where, at the nose of the cam, where you've got maximum load against the lifter, you see how wide it becomes, okay? And now you see, when we get right to the top of the nose, there's only a very small amount of the low metal. So remember, this is the high metal, this is the low metal. There's only a small amount of it visible. You come around to the backside, and you'll see that it starts to taper off again. Because as the load diminishes on the lifter, it's pushing less into the, into the, lo into the, the lobe itself. And now we get to where there's almost nothing at all. Now when you get to an older, and this is, this is a good pattern. When you get to an older cam, it's not unusual to find that this area here is completely gone, right? Where, where it's gonna be flat, straight across the nose of the, of the lobe. That in itself is not a terrible thing. That's typical of a higher mileage camshaft. As long as you still have this pattern to the one side on the ramps, you're fine. Because it'll be rotating all the way through. It gets to the top right here. Remember, it's only here for, a, for a, a, just a, a fraction, a, a thousandth of a second. It's here. The inertia is still the inertia of the lifter spinning is still there, and it's really not much to worry about. If you've, if you've done a break-in, if you've only gone, let's say, the, the, uh, you know, the, the 20 minutes at 2,000 RPM, and you don't see any low metal, so all you see right here is just the high metal, the shiny stuff, that means that this, that break-in not, was not successful. That, that thing will wipe itself out. But after your, your initial break-in period, a relatively low mileage camshaft, this is exactly what you want to see. You want to, you want to make sure that you're, you're always seeing some of the low metal. As long as you see the low metal, it means that the taper is in effect and the lifter is rotating the whole way through. Now, this shiny metal here is one other thing too we want to talk about, and that's the zinc. You know, everybody knows that in a flat tap, it, it doesn't matter hydraulic or, or solid lifter engine, you need zinc, ZDDP. So that zinc, it's, it's, it's microscopic metal. It's actually the, the metal, zinc, same stuff that you make pennies out of, right? But it's, it's in a powdered form. And that zinc is what this part of the lobe is being lubricated by, the, the actual metal-to-metal -metal part that's spinning the lifter, the high point, the high point of the, uh, the lobe. This is what the zinc is actually protecting. The rest of this lobe is on that film of oil that's being thrown up from windage and being dripped down from the lifter bore. 
So this shiny area right here, it's what's being protected by the zinc. If you run a flat tap and engine for any amount of time without any zinc in the oil, you're gonna find that this goes away real fast and you're just gonna have a straight shiny top of the lobe. It, it doesn't always mean certain death, but it's an indication that, that it's, it's, it's not wearing the way it's supposed to wear. I think that's it. I think I covered everything I wanted to talk about with this. Probably too much, right? This is, this is true motorhead nerd stuff. So that's it. I hope you got something out of that, and I'll see you tomorrow.